Olá, gente. Um, bom dia. Um, sejam se, sejam bem-vindos. Uh, o nosso seminário hoje é uh, para o nosso seminário hoje temos a honra e o prazer de ter Marcelo Messina da Laboratórios Nacionais do Gran Sasso. Ele tem uma ele tem uma carreira muito distinguida nos desenvolvimento dos experimentos para uh, partículas raras, oscilações de neutrinos para fenomenologia de partículas raras, tipo oscilações de neutrinos e matéria escura. Ele iniciou no experimento Corus uh, na Universidade de Nápoles e depois participou do desenvolvimento do experimento Opera, que alguns de vocês podem ser lembram de, uh, um, depois ele foi para o uh, Instituto de Zurich, onde ele trabalhou no Icarus, que se lembra bem, foi um experimento de matéria escura. Um, é, trabalhou no t case que é oscilação de neutrinos. E depois foi para a Universidade da Colômbia, onde nós descobrimos que nós, nós fomos lá ao mesmo tempo, mas não... Uh, <risos> mas não encontramos, o mundo é pequeno, mas não tão pequeno. Onde ele iniciou a trabalhar no experimento do Xenon, é onde ele ainda trabalha, o experimento do Xenon vai ser o experimento de que ele vai falar de hoje. Hoje ele, tá no, ele é um pesquisador no Instituto de Física de Gran Sasso, onde uh, no, na, uh, perto do Aquila, nas montanhas italianas, é a mais grande é o mais grande laboratório desse tipo de experimentos de neutrinos matéria escura não de aceleradores mas de detectores de matéria escura no mundo é, ele vai falar ele vai falar para nós sobre a nova física uh, as investigações recentes que eles fizeram um, como sempre eu vou pôr a lista de, o link da lista de presença no chat um, depois do seminário vai ter perguntas e respostas. Um, se você tem perguntas urgentes, pode pedir, pode pedir, mas normalmente, por favor, deixe as perguntas até o fim. É, um, thank you very much again for coming and you can start. It's a, so first of all, thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, it is a pleasure to talk to you, uh, and uh, so let's let's move soon to the physics. Uh, as I was already saying, the seminar is tuned on the I mean, for for uh, for students, and uh, and so I mean I will be maybe for somebody more experienced I can say something obvious. Uh, so you apologize. Uh, so just a quick outline. I will go through an historical introduction of dark matter evidence, uh, indirect evidence. I think it's interesting for students to hear how this idea of dark matter was born. Then, I, of course, I have to I will I will list some features of dark matter interactions, and then I move to detection technology. That is, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, in, in this uh, that is, I mean, uh, one of the key topic of this seminar. And then we, we we end up with the results of xenon family. We we will you will understand why I I, I say xenon family. So brief history. Uh, in 1922, this physicist, uh, Jacobus Kaptein, I, I think that the pronunciation can be a slightly different, it's a German name. Uh, uh, he, he just coined, he, he, I mean, uh, yeah, coined the name dark matter. Uh, he just realized something that I, I, I didn't know, I recently discovered. He realized that in his study of stellar motion, he realized that the Milky Way rotate, rotates as contrary to the common belief where the star moves randomly. I mean, only 1922, uh, the people were still believing that the star moved randomly, while this guy realized that they were just uh, uh, rotating. And then his student, this Jan Hort in uh, 1932, Jan Hort is this one, Jacobus is this one. Uh, Jan Hort determined the, that the Milky Way center rotation uh, uh, was something else than the sun, and it was not the sun. And then he claimed that it was more dark, more dark than visible matter in the vicinity of the sun. And in 1933, this uh, Swiss physicist that was working in uh, California Institute uh, uh, of Technology, uh, Frank Zwicky, uh, he, he, he used this, uh, this uh, Dunkel Materia name in, in so dark matter in German. 
And uh, he was the guy realizing that he was the first measuring the, speed, the, the, the rotational speed of galaxies in, a, in the coma cluster, in, the, the, in a cluster of galaxies. And he realized that this, the speed uh, of the, the rotating speed of the galaxy was higher than what you can predict by, let's, let's say, in quote, measuring the, by, by summing, I mean, by, by, I have to say, by summing the, the visible matter. I mean, if you, from, from just Newton law, if you, if you, have an, if you can estimate uh, the amount of matter that you have in a system, then you can also predict the rotational uh, velocity of, uh, of a star, of a galaxy that is, is bounded in this system. So it's a quite a simple exercise. Uh, I think that it's a, it's a nice cool exercise. Uh, how he measured the velocity actually by using the, the, uh, the, the redshift of, uh, of, the, of the galaxies as function of distance. Uh, and so, I mean, this idea of something that was missing, that was dark in the sense that it was not emitting light, so not visible uh, with our eyes, but in a, in a different way uh, was born in 1933. Uh, the same observation was repeated by Vera Rubin uh, she um, made the, the rotational curve of stars inside uh, a, 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 our galaxy. So, and she realized that, uh, so that the, 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 the rotational velocity of the stars in the Milky Way uh, was higher than expected if you consider the visible matter, the one that you can observe with telescope. Uh, and you, you, you predict by, by exploding Newton's law, you predict the, the rotational velocity. So this phenomena of something hidden that is providing more gravitation and so higher velocity was confirmed at the uh, level of uh, a galaxy instead of a cluster of a galaxy. So once more, just to make it clear, uh, if a system is gravitational bound, such as the star that, the star, that, uh, that form a galaxy, uh, so the, 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 the max, you know that there is a maximum velocity after which the, 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 the object flies away. And apparently the stars, they were moving at the velocity higher than the escape velocity. What I just mentioned is the escape velocity. And so they should have fly, uh, flown away. Instead, they, they, they were bounded to the galaxy. So there must be something that is dark and that keeps the star together in a galaxy. And this was confirmed in a spiral galaxies. Here, I, I put a collection of uh, uh, many indirect evidence of dark matter. Dark matter we didn't detect yet, but there are many strong evidence uh, of the fact that something that interacts according to Newton law must, must exist. Uh, here, uh, once more, is uh, just the evidence due to the rotational curves. Uh, here, there is another strong evidence the bullet clusters. I mean, these, those are two uh, uh, galaxy clusters that scatters one into each other. And this red shadow is just the, the, the hot gas, the gas that when they scatter, they get in an excited state, while the blue shadow represents the, 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 the matter that is not visible, uh, but you, we can deduce by the uh, gravitational potential profile. So by measuring uh, uh, gravitational potential in this region, we deduce that there is some matter here uh, that is not visible. And this matter is, is, a, is a significant amount, is much more than, than the red one. And actually, these two bulk of blue, let's say, the, or matters so of that matter that is indicated by this blue shadow, they cross to each other without scattering. So by analyzing this phenomena, this is a, a, a measured phenomena, even though there are many assumptions and simulation based on this analysis, uh, on which this analysis is based, uh, is deduced that uh, in these uh, two cluster of galaxies, there is much more invisible matter than visible matter. So another evidence that there is something that is not emitting light, but uh, is, is, is providing more gravitational uh, force than uh, expected if you consider only the visible matter. Then there are other evidence by, let's say, by subtraction also, uh, the nucleosynthesis tells us uh, that the amount of protons that, uh, and also light nuclei that have been generated after the Big Bang, uh, they, uh, they cannot account for all the energy of the universe. I mean, we can measure what has been, uh, uh, has been created at the beginning of the universe. I mean, the proton, the, in the intergalactic protons or helium-3, helium-4 or lithium uh, nuclei, they come from the, the beginning of the universe. 
And uh, from this, we can deduce the ordinary matters, the matter that uh, uh, is in the, in the Mendeleev table. And this matter can only account for 5% of, uh, uh, of the, the pie chart of the energy of the universe, so this pie chart. This pie chart is confirmed also by the measurement of the uh, cosmological microwave background. They also confirm uh, these measurements that uh, the, the, the pie chart of the energy of the universe is just done by a 70% a, a slice of 70% it's just dark energy that is the one that is responsible of the fact that <coughs> of the fact that the universe is uh, is accelerating and then there is the 5% that is ordinary matter and is a 25% that cannot be protons because protons are in this 5% that must be matter, matter in the sense of something that has a Newtonian interaction for the gravitational potential and accounts for 25% of the energy. If you count as matter, it's almost 85% of matter. So this, that, this, what we call dark matter really accounts for the most part of the matter of the universe. This must be of uh, uh, electron-like. We, 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 we are used to say leptons and not hadrons. Uh, this is the Hubble, Hubble plot that uh, shows the the, the, the speed of the galaxy as function of distance of, of the red shift. And this also, this plot is confirming that in the universe there is almost 70% of energy that is, uh, is responsible for the fact that the universe is, uh, is just accelerating, is increasing and accelerating. And so this is in agreement with these, uh, with these other result, with the results in agreement. So all this together, they make a strong indirect evidence of the fact that we have a, mm, a, a, something dark that does not emit light, but that provides gravitational uh, gravitational interaction. Uh, of course, I, I guess many of you are already thinking to modification of uh, of Newton law. This is a possibility, but many of these phenomena cannot be explained by uh, alternative gravitational theory. For example, this one. For this one, and it's not the only one. There are many others phenomena, uh, uh, gravitational lensing, for example, that can only be explained with something that uh, just follow the Newton law, not by an alternative gravitational, uh, the theory of gravitation. So, I mean, these indirect events are a strong evidence that there is something over there that uh, it's like uh, particles. We also, let me remind you that in, in, in every field of physics, we are looking for something that goes beyond the standard model of particle physics. So there is a large community that is looking for new particle states. And so if these particle states exist, they, they've been produced at the beginning of the universe and they are so flying around. Probably dark matter is just a purpuri, just a, 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 a mix of many different part, massive particles that provides more uh, interaction than, uh, uh, than what was expected. This is just a, a list of, uh, of um, the, the laboratory all over the world where, Grand Sasso, where dark matter search is, uh, is, is realized. And uh, you see, it's one of the most popular topic in, 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 in astroparticle physics. And I must say that, uh, I mean, uh, becoming more and more experienced in this field, I realized that it's really an interesting topic. I mean, uh, it's more than 80% of the matter of the universe. We don't know what it is. So um, if we want to really understand the universe better, we try to understand what is this dark matter. And the Grand Sasso is for sure the one of the lab, probably the lab with the largest number of dark matter experiments and one of the most involved in this, uh, in this research field. There are some, uh, uh, you know, there are um, uh, experiments and so laboratory in, uh, in, uh, in Canada, in the US, but also in Chile and in Australia and in the South Pole. This one are very important, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, laboratory in the South Hemisphere, because, uh, I mean, uh, uh, if this, I mean, if dark matter phenomena uh, at a certain point will be detected, uh, I mean, a physics, uh, uh, I mean, any, any phenomena, any possible background, they can be explained with, uh, with, uh, with, with uh, some environmental, uh, phenomena uh, should change the phase when you move from uh, north hemisphere to south hemisphere. While a physics uh, uh, a physics uh, mm, uh, phenomena should not change the phase. So being able to compare the the possible signal between two uh, laboratory in the north and the south it's very important. Indeed, this laboratory here in Australia is uh, in strong contact with the uh, experiment at the uh, Sasso, and there is uh, this project of uh, building two identical detectors and installing one at the Sasso, one in, in, in Australia. 
uh, this can be interesting for students. This is the seminal paper where uh, the direct detection was, uh, uh, was, 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 was born. Actually, the idea of the direct detection was born. Don't be confused. Indirect evidence of dark matter and direct detection. Direct detection means you, you try to detect uh, energy release of dark matter in the detector, but there is also indirect detection. Indirect detection, for example, is a uh, uh, anig possible annihilation of uh, particle antiparticles of dark matter in the sun that provides monoenergetic uh, uh, particles, neutrino in particular, because uh, not more than neutrinos we can get from the sun. This is in the indirect, uh, evidence, indirect detection. While in this seminar, we will be focused on direct detection, that is uh, the, 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 the measurements of the energy list of, the, of particles in, in a detector. And this was mentioned the first time in this, uh, in this paper, a uh, paper whose author are Bitten, Edward Bitten and Goodman. Uh, they said something very similar. If we are immersed in this cloud of particles, uh, time by time, they should interact with the detector. Of course, it's a very uh, uh, low probability phenomena. It's a rare phenomena with the, the cross section that is very low. And otherwise, we would have already, already seen. And so, better you install your detector in a protected environment where you, you are not overwhelmed by uh, background uh, uh, interactions. Uh, and, uh, and they also made a list of possible scenarios in which uh, uh, they calculated the cross-sectional interaction of this uh, new particle, possible new particle that they called WIMP, weak interactive massive particles, so heavy particles uh, with the typical cross-section of weak interaction. Um, they were, this, this cross-section here, they were, sorry, <coughs> I'm sorry. So this, uh, once more, this is a representation of the, uh, the direct uh, uh, detection or direct interaction. Uh, we can have an idea of the energy release because uh, the, the, density, the energy density associated to, to the, the, that we can measure by means of the gravitational potential is something quite well defined. I think it's 0.3 GB per cubic centimeter. So fixed the, the energy density uh, you can deduce how many particles uh, that you can get if you fix the mass. And so since the mass of these particles are expected in the range of G from, from few GV to a few hundred GV, the energy release is on this, uh, on this scale. Of course, everything I'm saying is in a, in a window parameter. Since we don't know the phenomenon, we don't know the cross-section, we don't know the mass of the particle, whatever we can say, it's just, uh, I mean, in a window, in, in an interval of uh, parameters like energy release, like cross-section or mass of the particle that we can, we can deduce. Here, some uh, uh, interesting aspect of the detection. Uh, here, I just made the, I mean, the rate, this interaction rate is given by the number of, uh, of, of targets uh, uh, times the number of, uh, of, uh, of particles, this is just the energy density divided by the mass of the particles times the velocity times the cross section. So these things are things on which we cannot do we cannot do anything because this is just uh, I mean par parameters that uh, are provided by nature. While we can try to increase this number that is uh, the mass of our detector and also our sensitivity. Here are reported some uh, uh, cross section differential rate as function of the energy is for different. Uh, uh, target elements, and you can see that according to, uh, I mean, uh, which is the energy window in which you want to work, you can have uh, uh, different elements that can be better than, than others. This, uh, this rate are calculated with this uh, WIMP mass and uh, cross-section, and also some nuclear effect are folded. For the, for the students that are not, are not used to this type of, uh, to the search of new phenomena, let me point out that uh, when you search for a new phenomenon and you don't find anything, it does not mean that your detector was just uh, uh, not, was not working actually. But uh, the absence of signal provides a very important information to the community. The absence of signal, if you provided that your detector was well designed, was tested and calibrated, is telling the community in, this, in the region where we had good sensitivity, in this uh, space of parameters, there was no signal, so better you, you look for uh, the signal somewhere else. And this exclusion plot, this line that defines the exclusion plot, is just the result of experiments, in particular, for example, this Xenon 1, this one of the Xenon detectors, 
uh, this is just a result of expanded that worked pretty well and didn't find any signal. Uh, this number here reproduces the number. I mean, if you want to have a sensitivity to these parameters in cross section in this space, the cross section versus the mass of the particle, I'm sorry, here maybe it's not well visible, but this is mass of the particle, uh, you cannot tolerate a, a, a spurious event. Let's say background event is what we call spurious event that can mimic the signal more than one event per kilogram per year. This is the level of uh, noise that you can accept. Because if you have so many, too many events that mimic the signal, you cannot deduce that much. I mean, you exclude always a smaller and smaller region. While if your detector provides a very little event, these events are the, the known backgrounds. I mean, these events are due to known phenomena that you can know that can mimic your signal, but are, uh, are phenomena foreseen in the standard model of particle physics. And so you can make an estimation. If so, if this number is little, so the expected number of events that can mimic your signal, signal that you're looking for, then you exclude, a, if you don't see anything, you exclude a large region. If you see many events, you discover dark matter. Now, once you've done, a detect, once you've done an experiment, you don't see anything, you put this line. So what you do next, you try to design an, a detector that uh, where the number of expected events that can mimic your signal is even smaller. And this, this here, you go from one event per kilogram per year to one event per ton per year. So three order of magnitude better. And so you are more sensitive. This is the typical results of a good experiment that searched for dark matter and didn't find anything. And this is a very important information for community because it's telling the community better you design a new detector that has sensitivity in other regional parameters and not in this region. This is some uh, consideration on the on a very general feature of cross section. Here you see under the hypothesis that uh, uh, the cross section uh, uh, does not depend by spin, uh, you can have a, a, a resonant uh, behavior. Uh, and so the I mean, <clears throat> if this uh, interaction of dark matter with the proton and neutron are the same, you end up with a with a coherent uh, uh, scattering cross section. I mean, coherent with respect to uh, to, to the number of, uh, of nucleons. And this is, uh, is something that uh, uh, amplified the cross-section significantly, say, so that, that there is a dependence by a squared. Otherwise, you can have also in a different uh, a theoretical framework, you can have a, a cross-section dependent by spin, so spin dependent cross-section. In this case, your cross-section depends by the, this, uh, this uh, coupling of the nucleons to protons or neutrons times the mean value of the of the, the 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 mean value of the spin amount that is provided by protons or neutrons. I mean, the nucleus, the spin of the nucleus is provided by separated by proton and neutron. They tend to to I mean to to couple in such a way they provide a, an amount. I mean, a contribution to the total spin that is this is for the proton is this one and for neutron is this one. So only uh, uh, nucleus with spin different from the total spin different from zero can test this uh, this hypothesis. Of course, here there is not a clear, uh, complete description. This M key, this is the mass of the particle we are considering. It's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not known. It's just a general feature of the cross section. If you want a detailed feature of cross section, you have to define which theoretical framework you are working in. Another important aspect of the dark matter interaction, something that can help the detection of dark matter or to, to clarify that what you are seeing is, is dark matter is uh, possible rate modulation. Why? Because <clears throat> it's like when you, you bike and there is no wind. If you bike fast, you feel the wind of the, the air coming on your face. It's the same thing. I mean, uh, dark matter is steady with respect to, to, uh, to our galaxy while we are moving in the galaxy. And uh, each six months, we change the direction of our, of our motion by something by and so there is a speed variation of almost 10 percent with respect to the total speed of the sun in the galaxy we are moving towards sinus uh, constellation so this phenomenon uh, gives a, a, a rate modulation that can be detected is expected to be a few percent with respect to the to the, the, the to the constant rate value and this can, can be a strong signature of dark matter interaction. Same things can happen in day night effect because on the day night, I mean, our detector uh, is moving with the Hertz. This is a, another motion composition that can give another um, sub leading uh, order uh, rate modulation. 
This is another important aspect. Since we're looking for very, very, very rare event, uh, better you, you don't install your detector a background where you are overwhelmed by cosmic rays. We know that uh, our body at sea level is caused by almost one particle per centimeter square per minute. Better you install your detector under a mountain where all these physics phenomena can be, can be reduced significantly. For example, in the Gran Sasso laboratory in Italy, the number of cosmic rays goes from uh, one per minute, uh, uh, per, one per centimeter square per minute at sea level to one per square meter per hour under the Gran Sasso mountain in the Gran Sasso laboratory that correspond to almost a factor, factor 10 to 7 reduction, six, something times 10 to 6, so almost 10 to 7. And this is very important. Of course, this type of uh, reduction, this reduction is never sufficient. You, we always invent something more to protect our detector. You will see more details, in more details this, uh, um, uh, this uh, I mean, recipe, let's say, to, to protect your detector by external background. So once more in this slide, uh, we, if you want to design a dark matter experiment, first you, you put your detector under a, a, a good mountain. Then you surround with your detect with a veto detector, a detector that often is made by water installed with the, with the photomultiplier because it's a cheap solution, but it's not all the case. Uh, and uh, and this uh, water sharing of detector just tells you in case there is something in your detector that is in correspondence with the charge with the muons that is crossing, or maybe also with the neutrons that is crossing in this water. Uh, I mean, this is telling you that maybe what you see in your detector is due to this particle, and so you reject the event. So this is so-called a beta detector. Another very important requirement is that in your detector you have a space sensitivity, so you can reconstruct the position of the events that are, uh, happen in your detector. And from this, from the, the, the position reconstruction, you can say if the events happen on the edge, where there is the accumulation of the of the events due to the background of the end coming from outside they accumulate on the on the edge of your sensitive volume or if you have event in the middle if you have event in the middle means that it's something that has a very low cross section that is crossing all your detector uh, and this might well be something that has the cross section of weak interaction and not uh, uh, electrons or photons or neutrons that are standard particle whose cross section interaction we know we know very well and we know that they are stopped on the edge of course, different detectors, they have different stopping capability, but these, uh, those are numbers that are very well known. So you can predict, like in this simulation here, this is a simulation of using TPC. Another very important uh, uh, recipe of the design and construction of a dark matter detector is the measurements of the radioactive contamination of elements. This is a typical plot of the measurements of uh, one of the, of the components of the detector. In the, in the xenon detector, we uh, measured each single screws and electronic components that we use for the detector. No, nothing went inside without being measured. Uh, so a screen before, and uh, and we have. Uh, I mean, at the Gran Sasso, it's one of the lab where we can do the most sensitive measurements of radioactive contaminants in the in the elements, and they are aiming at having the best measurements in the in the world. So we have these uh, several facilities in which, in which we can measure all these radioactive components in metal, in plastic, in electronic components, in whatever you can imagine. You can cut in pieces and put in one of these detectors. You can really uh, know everything is inside. And so you can, you can sort this element. You can choose the, the, the cleanest one. So once more on background reduction, uh, first of all, we said the uh, uh, shielding, so very deep underground, large, large shield outside, so lead, water, poly, poly, polypropylene, uh, active beta in order to reject muons. Self-shielding means that uh, the capability of the detector to distinguish between events happening in the core of the detector and the, from events happening on the edge of the detector. Uh, and then you should also do some hypothesis. I mean, uh, uh, nobody knows an experiment without knowing anything. This, I mean, I remember once I was at CERN at a, co at a, at a, a conference uh, on uh, statistical treatment of data, and somebody was saying, uh, uh, ah, no, no, when I, when I treat, when I analyze my data, I, I, don't, want, I don't know anything. Uh, the guy was insisting, saying, I don't want to know anything, I don't know anything, and somebody else answered, but uh, if you don't know anything, why uh, you should get the money to do an experiment? 
this to say what? That I think pretending to do sim really a measurements uh, without any a priori knowledge, it's really a bit naive. You have to put at least in the game what you know, what you, you trust. And yeah, for example, what you know is the interaction of, uh, of protons and of uh, photons and of electrons. And you know that, uh, uh, for example, neutrons, neutrons can mimic very well with uh, interactions, so dark matter interaction. However, neutrons, they interact uh, adronically. So they can do multiple scattering, but the cross-section is very high. So if you see an interaction, multiple interaction, that looks like dark matter interaction, so just a, a nuclear recoil, but uh, uh, sorry, this is just quickly said, but I will, I will, I will spend more time on defining the, the dark matter interaction detector. Anyway, so just accept for now that the neutrons really looks like dark matter, neutron interaction looks like dark, dark matter interaction, but neutrons can do more than one interaction, can do multiple interaction. If you see in a detector two, three interactions, then this cannot be, uh, this cannot be dark matter. And this is something uh, that uh, this is an a priori knowledge that you should put in your, in, your, in your analysis. You should not be afraid of using it. And so this is here, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, pointed out that of course we put in, for example, uh, when, when, uh, we be, uh, when the part, dark matter particle interacts with, the, with the, a, 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 a noble liquefied liquid, uh, so xenon, xenon detector or argon detector, uh, uh, from the E of the X, you can distinguish between uh, particles with different ionization potential. This allows you to distinguish between an electron recoiling or a nucleus recoiling. And actually there are more variables that can distinguish between these two events. And you can distinguish if, uh, so you can disentangle if this is just an electronic recoil due to a, a radioactive, uh, radioactivity impurity that is providing an electron, or maybe it's a, a nuclear recoil due to something neutral that enters from outside that means dark matter. So this is what I want to point out here in this slide. Let's come to long lasting story of the xenon experiments. So I start to, to tell you, to introduce you to the xenon detectors. Xenon detectors is just a liquid argon TPC, and I will tell you, uh, sorry, liquid, liquid, uh, a time projection chamber. So a liquid xenon time projection chamber. Uh, I will tell you what is a, a time projection chamber. Just uh, accept that the, the, the sensitive target is xenon. So it's a liquefied noble uh, element. Uh, why liquid? Because it's easier to put together a large amount of mass. Why noble elements? Noble elements, because you will see, we need to be able to collect electrons uh, due to the, that are, that are, I mean, free electrons that are given are due to the WIMP interaction, to the dark matter interaction in the detector. So if you want to collect electrons, better you don't have any electronegative elements in the target. And this is the case of uh, noble liquids. They are not electron, at least, uh, 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 yeah, they are not electronegative, uh, uh, all the noble elements. While, for example, beer, beer is scintillating. In principle, we you can do a detector with beer, but beer contains a lot of uh, a lot of water that is electronegative. For sure, we'll not be able to collect electrons in in beer. And you will see why we we need to detect not only light in this type of detector, but also 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 electrons. So this is the family of the tech of the xenon uh, TPC. Uh, xenon 10 was a very little detector that was uh, was built in 2005 with a very little. Uh, 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 target 15 kilograms, uh, thousand events of began expect, and this was the limit that it was provided. So this was the best cross section, uh, the smallest uh, cross section that was was tested. And uh, with this detector, the collaboration tested the principle, and they have shown that so the xenon xenon was working very well. Then from xenon 10, they passed they, they passed to xenon 100 in 2008 with 62 kilograms of instrumented uh, target. The expected event in the region of interest was five events, and this was the cross section. Once we in this case, the dark matter was not detected, and so this was the limit, the best limit that was put on the cross section interaction of dark matter with ordinary matter. Uh, and with this detector, the collaboration will lead the field for many years. Uh, it is still leading the field, actually. And from this collaboration, this uh, experimental expertise, there were born two more uh, uh, collaboration and detector, LAX and Panda X. LAX is a detector in the US that is very, very similar to the Xenon detector. And Panda X is a detector that is running in, in, uh, in China. And this also is very similar. It's, what, what these, these two projects were started by scientists that were in the collaboration in this, 
uh, in these years. And then uh, this is when I started, actually, when I joined the collaboration with Zino Anton, bringing my expertise in the large size uh, uh, time projection chamber in 2016, was built in 2016, actually, I joined the collaboration in 2011, two tons of uh, instrumented target, zero two event expected in the region of interest, and this was the, the cross-section that was, uh, was tested, and so this was the best limit. Uh, this is the present detector that is under commissioning at the moment. You see how the mass went from 15 kilograms, 62 kilograms, 2 tons, 6 tons. Actually, this is instrumented mass because the, the amount of xenon into the cryostat is, uh, uh, is, is 8 tons. Why cryostat? Because xenon at room temperature is not liquid, it's gas. So to keep it liquid, you have to cool it down. And so you have to keep it in a cryostat. Cryostat is just a container capable to keep the liquid at very low temperature. This is the expected background the region of interest. And you see how the background expected. So background is this event that can mimic your dark matter interaction. And this is the cross-section that we can test the stars because these are not yet uh, measured. Let's say this number, this is a predicted number. Uh, and also from this detector will bond, there are these two new projects that is just larger size. So this is the same collaboration, the one in, uh, in, uh, in the US and the one in China, but with the larger mass also. They are also uh, building detectors with a very big mass. And then there is Darwin that the possible will be the possible future of Zinon and Tons, much larger detectors of 40 tons detected by something very far to come. So uh, uh, Xenon collaboration was very, was providing many detectors. They went very uh, slowly in the, the, testing the principle, showing good results, and then going to the ton mass scale and multi-ton. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was a very successful story. So here I represent the principle of a time projection chamber. So first of all, I already told you why we need, uh, why we need uh, a, a, a target of, uh, uh, of, of a noble element, because uh, uh, when you release energy in one of these detectors, you, pr you produce prompt light. First of all, you put some scintillation that can be detected by the photomultipliers. You see here uh, two arrays of photomultipliers on top and bottom. This is the liquid xenon, and here there are some electrons that provide electric field. But then you also uh, strip electrons from surrounding atoms, uh, these ionization electrons, that if you provide with a suitable electric field, you can extract this electron from the liquid to gas phase. You can accelerate electrons in the gas phase and provide a secondary light pulse. We are used to call S1 and S2, prompt and secondary. Now, by comparing S1 and S2, by the ratio of the area of the two signal, you can distinguish uh, uh, events with different E of D. So you can distinguish uh, particles with different ionization power. So you distinguish between electrons that are coming from uh, radioactive contaminants uh, from uh, nuclear recoil that might be due to either neutrons or uh, uh, dark matter interactions. Uh, but there is another important aspect uh, uh, that by measuring the time distance between the first and second light pulse, knowing the velocity, you can know the depth. And by measuring the light pattern of the, of the primary light, you can know the transverse coordinate. So you know the depth, you know the two transverse coordinates, you put together this information, you can reconstruct the position where the interaction took place. It means that you can distinguish events happening in the middle by event happening on the edge. And so you can fiducialize, as we are used to say. So you can uh, uh, reject an event if it's too close to surface or accept the event if uh, it's happening in the, in the, in the middle. Uh, here in this plot is represented the, the S2 over S1, or uh, I mean, or, or you can also, this is the similar feature of the ratio S2 over S1 versus S1. I mean, this just means uh, 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 this, this ratio versus the energy scale. Uh, and you see the blue, the blue dots and red of the blue is just your electron uh, uh, calibration recoil, and the blue are just due to the uh, neutron calibration recoil. And you can see how can they, these two set of particles that are used for calibration can be distinguished. Electron, they mimic the background, and the neutron, they can mimic the, the, the dark matter. And so this uh, S2 over S1 gives you uh, a strong... Uh, a, a strong uh, distinction capability uh, between different type of particles. Uh, if xenon detector is not the best from this point of view. It's the best for other things, but not, uh, for example, argon that uh, actually is very used to it and is much better in this, uh, in this aspect. 
let's go ahead. Here I have a, a little movie of the, that's uh, represent the typical uh, web interaction in a detector. In a, in TPC. This is a picture of Xenomanton detector while it was, uh, was underbuilt. This is just a, a cartoon, of course. These, those are not the real, the real uh, uh, photo multipliers. While this one, it's just the field cage. This, those are the electrons that provide this uniform field that allows to move the electron from the, 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 the point where they have been produced to the, to the surface and extract to the, to the, to the gas, uh, uh, gaseous uh, uh, state. Here you see a picture of the Xenon uh, infrastructure underground. This is uh, our uh, service building, and this is the water tank. The water tank that is a vapor detector that is surrounding the TPC. Here on this banner, you see how the cryostat that contains uh, uh, this is Xenon 1000, so contains the, the three tons of uh, Xenon. Is, is built and this is the, the beta detector around and this is the water tank that contains all the beta detectors. Uh, our service building and on top here we have the cryogenics and purification. Uh, cryogenics is just to keep the xenon, uh, uh, the xenon um, in liquid form. Purification is very important uh, device because uh, uh, I told you we have to detect the light and electrons. When we're talking about electrons, we're talking about few electrons, even just a couple of electrons, few, really 10 electrons. And the couple of electrons, 10 electrons to drift in, on a meter distance, it's very a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. You can even tolerate to waste, to, to, to waste or to lose a single electron. So we need to purify the xenon. And we purify really at an extreme case. Imagine that the purification level that we achieve is. Uh, such that we have one electronegative impurities that uh, we don't want, uh, one each 10 to 10 uh, xenon atom. This is the level of purity that we managed to achieve. So it's really, really extreme. <coughs> Sorry, this is not COVID, uh, this is allergy. Then in the middle floor, we had the DRQ and some uh, meeting room, and then we have uh, the krypton. I will tell you something about why we need krypton distillation. And this is the xenon storage uh, recovery. This, uh, this sphere container is where we can recover the xenon in case of any, any issue or when we stop the experiment, we recover the xenon from here to this and we put in, in safe condition here. And, uh, and, and so we, we are happy not to lose xenon. Xenon is something very precious and very, very expensive. Very precious because it's difficult to, to buy and it's also very expensive. This is some picture of during the construction of Cusino Vanton. This is in the clean room uh, in the water tank while uh, during the, the assembling of the detector. Here some feature of the detector. Here the, just uh, how the data were collected from 2016 to 2018. We also suffered of some uh, earthquake that uh, uh, made us to stop for only a few days actually. Uh, and then we, we restarted because, I mean, uh, the, the, the Grand Sasso area is very, uh, yeah, I mean, you can have strong uh, earthquake. Uh, this is something that I think it's very important to point out and we are very proud of. This is the calibration. Uh, this, this plot gives only the, not only the calibration of the thread, but also the, the expected background rate in a very large energy window from MEV to 10 keV where we expect the signal. And you see how well we managed to, to reproduce the, the, the peak of the, uh, uh, of the contaminants, let's say, no? the background, the, the contaminant that makes background events. And this is very important. I mean, this means that we know very well how to predict the number of uh, undesired events. So if we predict uh, to see only one event and we see few five or 10 events, we can be sure that we are observing something. And this is a very important point. And you see that uh, we are able to predict with our model very well, also in the region where the physics takes place, because the physics of dark matter search is done in this, in this region. Those are all, all calibration, uh, all, all, uh, all events due to, to the contaminants that we are able to measure. And this is also the resolution of the detector's function of the energy release. And you see here reported some numbers. We have 60%, 6% resolution to 40 keV on energy release. That is a, a, very good, a very good result. 
Here we start some, uh, some simulation. I'll show you some simulation. Here you see uh, data in Monte Carlo simulation of neutron interaction. You see neutron interacts very strongly. So when, they, when neutron are shoot from outside to inside, they stop soon on the edge, as I was saying. Well, those are uh, uh, electron recoil, uh, electron calibration events. How we made the electron going into the middle with some gases, uh, 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 a discrypto at T3M, that is a gas uh, instable element that provides beta decays. And so we, we, we put this uh, gas inside. And of course, we, we actually, we don't need to remove because it decays in a few days. So we, after a month, we are sure that we don't have any contaminants that they can provide fake events. And so, but we have many events for calibration. This is the way we calibrate the detector with respect to electron recoil. While for neutrons, we, have, we can only shoot a neutron from outside and we will have these uh, uh, events uh, crowding just at the edge region, but we cannot do that much more. This is a very important uh, uh, plot. Uh, you know, the, the xenon is, uh, uh, xenon is, is, is taken by, from the atmosphere. There is no other way to get xenon. And in the atmosphere, there are several contaminants that are beta unstable, so they can provide event. For example, xenon is collected together with krypton-85 that uh, comes from uh, nuclear uh, uh, experiments. Uh, it was produced by, so it's a, a, as an uh, uh, anthropologic origin, this krypton-85. Now, uh, we cannot tolerate the description of the fact. The reason why xenon is, uh, is, uh, is chosen for, for dark matter search is because the xenon has no uh, long-lived uh, isotope, so has no um, source of background events. But crypto that is not an isotope of xenon that comes with xenon can provide uh, um, such background events. And so we want to remove it. How we, we do it? We do with the krypton distillation. We have a, a distillation column that works just like uh, when you distill grappa. Uh, and uh, we, so because they have a boiling point much different, krypton and xenon, if you uh, put the, if you, I mean, flow the xenon through a distillation column, what you get is that uh, the, the gas, uh, the gas phase of xenon is gets enriched by krypton 85. You remove the gaseous uh, phase and uh, you get a xenon much, much cleaner. In, uh, uh, with respect to the contaminant, the crypto-85 contaminant. Uh, here you see the evolution of the contaminants uh, as, a, as function of time while the krypton column was running. And here we achieve a contaminant of crypto-85 at level of 0.66 ppt, so 600 parts per quadrillion. It's very, very little number. This makes the xenon, the xenon detector very, very clean with respect to possible electron recoil event. And this made us, uh, that gave us the possibility to do very interesting search uh, in this channel of electron recoil. Then there are other sources of uh, uh, beta decay that is rather decay chain, for example. We can have two beta decays that can be source of background. <coughs> But we managed to reduce the radon contamination at the level of 10 micro becquerel per kilogram. We measured the contamination in terms of becquerel per, per kilogram. And the new detector, the, the, the last detector of the family, Xenon and Ton, actually this, uh, this, uh, this number was reduced by a factor of 10 to almost one micro becquerel per kilogram. And this krypton column that is working pretty well is actually the same for Xenon and Ton and then Ton and is working in a very, in a very uh, amazing way. Here are some numbers. Uh, here, uh, some numbers uh, in terms of background. This is, uh, I mean, in, uh, not in the region of interest, but I mean, in, in a larger region, there were 75 events uh, predicted and 82 events uh, uh, detected. So they are absolutely compatible uh, within the uncertainty. And this made Xenomanton the, the cleanest detector uh, ever, ever built. Uh, but having a glance at the future, so a new magnetic punk for xenon circulation significantly improves the purity and, and, and so the lifetime. The lifetime that is uh, the mean time in which you lose an electron that is, uh, is connected to this purity that I was mentioning before, we call lifetime, of course, but it's not that the electron is decaying, just the electron is ca captured by possible electronegative impurities. And this, uh, there is a, a version of the column that is also reducing the radon level, and so the electronic oil background. So these are uh, some new uh, novelty elements of the new detector. Uh, maybe here I can say that this, uh, 
this uh, distillation column that in the case of krypton keeps the xenon the liquid phase a krypton in the gaseous phase and so we are able to remove krypton in the case of radon radon coming from the surface is uh, any surface in the world is emanating radon in our in our house wherever so uh, we are able to remove the radon emanated by plastic surface mainly by using a krypton distillation in reverse mode so there is a, a second krypton distillation that we uh, we use at, uh, with the temperature gradient such that the radon that has a lower boiling point with respect to xenon is kept on the bottom. So all the radon that is emanated by surface is kept in this, uh, for a while in this cup. I mean, this happens dynamically, not when I say on it for a while, it's, a, it's just a continuous phenomenon. And uh, uh, we, we keep the, the flow such that the radon stays uh, in the column for a time long enough to decay and so does not provide the spurious event into the detector. So this is a second distillation column that is, is used in the, in, the, in the reverse mode, let's say. So it's, uh, it's the, 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 the element that you want to select is, uh, is staying uh, in a colder phase and not in a warmer phase, on the bottom, not on top. Here are some uh, uh, list of possible uh, uh, source of, uh, of neutrons from radiogenic neutrons from alpha and reaction in the material. This is the rate that is expected and, and the fraction. Uh, we can have also coherent and neutrino scattering on the nucleus. Uh, and uh, this also is an irreducible background, but fortunately, it's still quite the, 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 what we expect from a coherent energy interaction in the detector is quite little in terms of interaction rate. And then there are neutrons induced by muons. I mean, muons, they can uh, kick off neutrons from the nucleus, and uh, these neutrons can, can mimic dark matter interaction, but this also is quite, uh, quite little. So the most dangerous thing is, uh, is just we have to pay attention to the element that we select to build our detector. There must be something very clean when that, that does not contain uranium and thorium. I think that uh, when we make a weld, uh, when we assemble our, our detector, our cluster, for example, we choose not only the tip of the welding machine, but also the filler metal. We screen, we measure also the filling metal. We cannot use any standard filling metal. So there is a very crazy attention in the, the element that you put in any corner of your detector in order to minimize this, uh, this number. Here we start to look at data in order to avoid biasing uh, your analysis, what we did, we did a blind analysis, so we covered the region where we expect, and this we have to make an hypothesis, where we expect the uh, possible signal. We define all our, uh, uh, when I say cut, it's not cut in the sense that you, you put a cut on energy distribution or position distribution, but the, the, the analysis is based on the likelihood. So in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a multivariate analysis in a multidimensional space, even though you can always project your, uh, your, your multidimensional space on 2D. For example, here you see the, this is a CS, this is the, the delayed signal with respect to prompt signal. Uh, and this is the region where you expect signal in this space. And this is the region of the background events. This is in a physical, this is a projection in a physical space. Uh, you see the, the background events are accumulated on the, on, the, on the edge. This is versus R squared. And this is uh, uh, here. It's uh, yeah. In uh, in this region, we have almost nothing. This is background is accumulated just in the, in this region and in in this at large at large R square just on the edge where there is the the the, the crust that is containing the uh, the is containing the the liquid zinc. This is a. a the efficiency curve, so we have a very good detection efficiency and the selection capability quite constant. Uh, and these are the, some requirements that we, 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 we apply. So threefold coincidence on the photomultipliers uh, and, and, and many and several others. Here also some uh, uh, comparison between what we predicted and what we uh, what we get from the data. Uh, once more, uh, we don't define really a fiducial volume because the, the analysis is based on the likelihood, so in a multivariate space, but at least we can compare in a given volume how many events we expect, how many background events we expect, and how many we detect. And we see that apart this statistical oscillation, we have quite a good agreement between the uh, uh, predicted background and, and detected. 
And here we, uh, this is the unblending of the data. Here there are once more, uh, those are some events that are in the, in the region of interest. This does not mean that we detect the dark matter, but it's just the projection from a multidimensional space to a two-dimensional space that makes some event lying in, the, in, the, uh, in this uh, subspace of the region of interest. But this just to, once more to tell you that the most part of them is accumulating outside of the region of interest. Uh, and here there are also some, uh, some, uh, some, some, some uh, this pi means that uh, in this region, if there is dark matter interaction, you, you would see just uh, this percentage of, 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 uh, of uh, this percentage of dark matter event with respect to background. It's a bit, um, bit tricky to interpret, it's not, it's not real. Here, uh, some uh, projection of these events in the physical space, uh, so uh, radius uh, and z and, and, and the depth. And here is the limit that we get. We didn't discover dark matter, so we get the limit while we have these uh, this, uh, little windows here. These, these windows is the sensitivity of the detector that is what was much definitely better than the competitors, uh, uh, Lux and Panda X. This is actually what you expect from it. This is uh, how the detector is, the, this, this line reflects how the detector is designed and what can do. But then possible statistical oscillation can make the results that is the exclusion limit a bit worse. Indeed, this exclusion limit in this uh, of a Xenoanton result with respect to competitor is a bit worse than what was expected, but this you cannot do anything. This is just statistical oscillation that can make the things worse or better. So this is the region that we excluded with a minimum cross-section 4.1 to minus 47 centimeters squared at a 30 GB uh, width mass. This is a, a once more comparison with the, with the others, and this is the, the region allowed by uh, the, the theorist. Uh, and this is the, the limit of neutrino interaction from sun. At a certain point, that the, our detector will be sensitive to neutrino interaction from sun. In this case, you start to have a serious problem in distinguishing between neutrino interaction and the possible dark matter interaction. Uh, this is the limit that we, we, we aim at reaching and, and stop then or invent a new way, and there are, there are some, some, some things that we can do. This is a, a, a nice list of possible, uh, not possible, sorry, of, of analysis that have been done by the, the Xenon one, uh, the Xenon collaboration with the Xenon Monton data. So we investigate physics in many, many fields. Uh, and uh, this is uh, just exclusive reason obtained with the different analysis based on different phenomena. So we, we, we managed to investigate also a region where we didn't expect to have a sensitivity. For example, this region below 1 GV of dark matter mass, we really didn't expect any sensitivity while uh, I mean, studying new possible new phenomena, uh, uh, we, we, we managed to put a limit also in a region where we didn't expect to have a sensitivity. Uh, this was a very nice publication. We detect a double electron capture in this phenomenon. That is the rarest phenomena ever measured. This is the longest lifetime ever measured, 10 to 22 years, and this was published on Nature. We are very proud of this, uh, uh, of this detection, but this is a standard phenomenon. There is nothing, uh, this was just very rare, very long lived uh, phenomenon, but uh, never, never measured directly before. There was an indirect measurement. Uh, from some Russians, but the detector, this was the first direct measurement of a double electron capture uh, in this uh, of, of 124. Here it comes to this uh, exciting mystery from electron recoils. As I told you, we are very confident in the energy calibration and in the uh, to which extent we know the, the, the background contamination in this region of interest, so below the 30 keV. And we are very, very confident in, uh, in, the, in how we know the detector in this region. And then we look at, uh, uh, we look there and we see that there is definitely some excess with respect to the background model in this region, 17 keV. So when you see something like this, and, and like, like that, and you really trust your detector, uh, what you say? The first thing is that, first of all, you repeat all your calibration what we are doing. Then you think that there might be a background that you, you, you just forgot. And this background uh, that is uh, I mean, events that are mimicking your signal, but uh, um, uh, not due to dark matter interaction, maybe you just forgot that they are showing up now. And so we started this process. 
in the process of trying to scrutinize what, what can be this excess. Uh, one possible is argon-37. Argon-37, uh, it's uh, capable to, if you put, this is a, let's say, a, 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 a simulation, no? if you put uh, this argon-37 that decays uh, with the half-life of uh, 35 days, I think, uh, 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 providing electron with 2.8 keV, you can describe quite well the data. Here, the black dot are data and the red is the background model plus argon-37. The problem is that you need 65 events per ton per year or argon-37 to justify the amount of data that you see. While uh, this argon, where should come from? Should come from the air. This is just a leak. Some air is entering in your detector. The problem is that argon-37 should come with the oxygen and nitrogen. They are main components of the atmosphere. But we didn't see any excess of nitrogen or oxygen. And we managed to put an upper limit on the number of events expected because of argon-37 contamination at this level. So argon-37 hypothesis is excluded, even though it's one of that best can, can describe this peak. But I mean, we really don't understand where this argon-37 can, can come from. So we start to test all possible axion, uh, axion particles. You know? There are uh, axions in many theoretical framework. Uh, and you can see that if, uh, I mean, the red, the black always are, 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 the are the same data that I've shown before. The black dot represents the data I've shown before. They are on that same level on the y-axis. While this background model here, there are different background models. The, let's say the standard background, the one that I mentioned so far, standard plus some tritium or tritium, some excess of tritium in the, in the, in the some contamination of tritium in the detector that can provide some backgrounds. And this is represented by the gray line. Or you can put some axions. Axions is just a combination of these possible uh, axions in different theoretical framework. And uh, they provide this uh, red line, uh, this uh, background model prediction that is represented here by the red line. I mean, as I have said at the beginning, before I start to talk uh, the, 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 the colloquium, uh, what I want to point out here is just how our detector is, is working well. And we should then do all the tests that is in our end. Now, defining which is the best theoretical framework in which we can explain this excess if we get convinced, because we are not yet convinced that this is something new. Uh, this is not uh, our first job, let's say. First, we want to get convinced that we have something new if this is something new. This was another a, a, a little physics run of 24 days where we reduced the background level, we improved the purification, that means more electrons, uh, uh, and we try to test better the, the tritium hypothesis. Uh, here you see the prediction due to the, the background of this run plus tritium, and uh, I mean, we accommodate a bit better this excess, but still is not conclusive. Uh, the background model is this Vavra 2.3 sigma level. So, uh, here you see the collection of ah, another possible model to explain this excess is just a neutrino interaction uh, where the cross section is enhanced because of magnetic moment. You know, the since neutrino has a mass, they can uh, show up in magnetic moments. Uh, and so at the very low energy, you can see the neutrino cross section interaction increased because of this magnetic moment. The problem is that the magnetic moment that we need to explain this excess is something that is, uh, is in contrast with some astrophysical limits. So, uh, I mean, we provide this limit, but the extension with the, with the measurements in other fields. And here you see the excess of the data with respect to all possible uh, uh, prediction in different uh, uh, theoretical uh, framework. Here, this is a sanity check. It's just you see that the significance does not depend about the energy threshold. Uh, and this is our efficiency in the region where this uh, excess shows up. Um, so, I mean, this is important to see that you are not, yeah, your significance is not moving with the threshold, so it means that uh, the, the condition of the analysis are very stable. And here, once more, a list of all the hypotheses that, that we have made, tritium background, solar actions, the magnetic moment of bosonic dark matter, this is another, I mean, uh, possible light dark matter, because it's a bosonic, can clusterize around the sun. Uh, Many, I mean, many theoretical frameworks can provide particles that could explain this excess. Uh, we don't want to enter so much in this hypothesis, but we have to test what can be possible background due to standard particles. For example, tritium. The tritium hypothesis is something that we have still to investigate. This could be, could be that uh, tritium is uh, 
there is some tritium contamination. Here in this plot uh, is represented how tritium we expect to decrease because there is in the, in the end there is tritium. So all the components of the detector are exposed to tritium contamination. But this is uh, is, is reduced during the life of the experiment from when you move from above ground to underground, the tritium decays. Uh, then there is the purification uh, that should degrade. I mean, the purification should capture the tritium uh, at this level, while we see the tritium at this level. So tritium from atmosphere is quite improbable because our purification phenomenon is based on electronegative uh, impurity attachment should also capture tritium. Why we see much more tritium? Probably. If this is this signal is due to tritium, is, this is generated, is emitted by plastic component. There is a lot of plastic, a lot of Teflon in our detector that uh, is emitting uh, uh, molecules with, uh, with uh, one atom of tritium. This is a, possible, a possibility, but uh, we don't have a, a, a clear understanding of this phenomenon. We, we can only measure possible. Uh, and it is also not trivial to measure tritium that is emitted by, by, by plastic components. Uh, but we are investigating in this direction. Uh, this is also important. This is a calibration with argon-37. We are injecting some argon-37 that decays uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, what I said, 35 days, I think. Yeah. Uh, and this is important to calibrate. And this is a preliminary analysis where you see that the PICA 2.8 keV uh, of argon that is exactly the region of the excess. Uh, I mean, this is the the prediction of the detector, and this is the data of calibration, they, 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 they fit pretty well. So our detector is behaving very well in this region in terms of energy reconstruction. And this is really, really this must be published, and this is very comfortable, it means that we know very well how to reconstruct the energy in this region, and so <clears throat> we, we can trust uh, our energy reconstruction. So we are upgrading our detector xenon and xenon m ton. That is eight tons of xenon, uh, liquid xenon, with uh, four tons of instrument of, uh, of fiducial volume. Let's say uh, this is the new detector where we just changed the, the the DPC and we made the cluster a bit larger, but all the infrastructure is the same. Uh, actually, we instrumented our detector with the gadolinium doped. Uh, water uh, sharing of detector. Why gadolinium doped? Because with this way we can reject back to the neutrons coming from outside. Actually, the neutrons come from inside, but this will be too long to explain. This is a picture of the new TPC of xenon uh, and ton. You see here, two, all these white parts are Teflon that can provide some tritium emission. This is some preliminary events in the, in the, in the, that we got in the commissioning phase. Uh, this is a picture of the guy during the, new, the, the neutron uh, uh, beta, the neutron beta installation. <clears throat> Here you see something that I already, already mentioned, this improved capability of purifying xenon. We went, uh, I mean, now the, the, the xenon life, the electron lifetime in xenon is seven milliseconds with respect to zero six milliseconds, it was in xenon one ton. So we definitely improved the circulation zero with new pumps and new, and new filters. Uh, then here, as you see, mentioned the new uh, radon removal system that uh, moved the radon contamination from 10, you remember, to one micro per kilogram. Uh, and this also is very important in terms of uh, number of, uh, of expected electronic coil events. Here's some evolution of the lifetime of the electron that improves with time. And this is the reduction. Instead, this is the reduction of radon contamination when the radon removal system is working. This is a nice collection of pictures of guys working and uh, enjoying the, the, the end of the, of the assembly of the TPC. And this is just a moment before we move the TPC on the ground. Uh, this is some collection of possible physics results. And, uh, and this is important. This is how the sensitivity of the axion versus uh, helium-3 discrimination, uh, sorry, tritium discrimination will evolve with, the, with time. And consider that uh, with the four ton fiducial mass in one year, we have four ton year exposure, means that we can distinguish between these two in, with eight sigma after one year data taking. So in one year, we will know really if this is tritium or it's new physics. When we say axons, we say new physics. We, I don't, we don't want to really bet on which is the, or, or, or we don't pretend to measure which is the to, to this integral, which is the best theoretical framework that I can explain. It just axioms here stands for new physics. So that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, a round of applause.
at least for me, I mean, I really like, I have to say before we start questions that um, I, I never worked in dark matter related things, but the, um, the idea that because of how rare are the events, sort of the overlap between this could be a revolution in physics or this could be just whatever, garbage, <laughs> fascinated me. I mean, the boundary between uh, between distinguishing between mundane stuff and, you know, something really new and extraordinary. Yeah. Um, so anyway, questions. Por favor, levanta a mão. Se você quer mandar a, a pergunta no texto, eu posso ler ela. Um, até em português eu posso traduzir. Jorge, um... may I start the question? I, I, I... Go ahead. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank Marcello for accepting uh, the invitation. I I'm always like here. very yeah. much your talk, which are very clear, very nice to listen. So yeah. I think that the student uh, have appreciated it. I just have two curiosities. Um, why did Xenon one ton run at 80 volt per centimeter, such a low field? Yeah, we had, uh, uh, of course, I mean, we had some issue with the, with the, with the electric field. I mean, in the, uh, in the, in the R&D detector, we have been able to, uh, to push the high voltage to 100 kilovolt per centimeter, 100 kilo. so I mean, on, on, across one meter, it's one kilovolt per centimeter. Uh, for some reason that is, we really didn't understand. I mean, we had an hot spot, you, you know, the cathodes that uh, is the electrode that we used to make the, or I know that you know very well, just for uh, the other, I mean, you, as, I, as you might remember, I mentioned this electric field that is created by some electrodes. Now, the, the, the bottom electrode, the cathode is made by wire, just stretched wires. Now, we try to ramp up the voltage to make the high field, and we realized that there was an hot spot, a spot from which we, we were detecting electrons. Uh, we managed to do our physics with the low field. So we were not able to increase the voltage. We kept the voltage quite low. And so the field, uh, and the, the good thing is that we realized that there was no, no reason to push the voltage so high. We managed to do all the physics we have done with this low voltage. And the, the funny thing is, funny or, or I don't know if it's funny or not. Anyway, uh, let's say the funny thing is that when we open the Xeno one ton, expecting to find something on this in this uh, in this point on the wire, something maybe since the wire they were gold plated, we I was betting actually I, I lost a bottle of wine because I was betting that the gold was just peeled off. Some gold was peeled off from the wire. Uh, we inspected the wire in the position with the microscope. We didn't see anything. The only sensible hypothesis that I could do is that maybe there is a tiny grain or some radioactive things from, uh, from beneath the, the gold that is coated on the wire that was emitting electrons, probably. I would not imagine anything else. The wire was perfect when we opened, but we were extracting electrons from this point. This is the reason why, I mean, the, apparently the electrode was perfect, was well designed, uh, probably, but this wire at this point was emitting electrons. Why? Uh, we, we don't know. So okay. this is why we were not able we were not able to push higher uh, the field, but then we stayed. We we are almost happy. I mean, we are happy to stay with low field because we 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 didn't we realized that we have been able to do quite good physics with this low field. Yeah, this is pretty common. <laughs> <laughs> no, with TPC. I see that there is a question on the chat. Just my last curiosity. And so, uh, what 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 is the plan beyond uh, xenon and ton? This is the last xenon uh, detector. We, we are going. You are then moving to Darwin. But me personally, is a personal question or in general? Because in general, we know that there is Darwin. There is a strong community that is pushing for for Darwin. Uh, I think that, of course, this, this Xenon is, is showing that it's a very great detector. Of course, it would be much better to have in the same lab Xenon and Argon, but this is, you can, I mean, uh, we, we, you know that this is other big project uh, that is uh, a dark side in our, in our uh, lab that hopefully one day will be working. Uh, so, I mean, this technology shows that it can do great things. So I can understand that in the future there might be Darwin and Darwin and the dark side, hopefully. Uh, 
I think that we need some aid from physics. I would like first to finish to complete this inner and tone, and then, according to the results, uh, take a decision. Of course, you cannot just wait uh, to the very end and then you start. So it's normal that people start to think to Darwin, but I think what will define the future of this technology it's if we find something new or not. Because if at certain point we get convinced that there are no winds, so no particle in the, in the, in the, in the mass region of GV, eh, probably we should start thinking to a new technology and looking for dark matter in a different region of mass and cross section. Because I, I, I'm quite convinced that dark matter is a particle. We need to explain what is this dark matter. Uh, but uh, I mean, if we don't find this region of uh, uh, parameter space we have to invent a new technology and you know very well that uh, i mean uh, making this new technology uh, mature for uh, making a detector takes time so i think before to really commit my life with the other experiments i would like to see what uh, and Anton will will say in one or two years from now Thank you, Marcello. For example, I mean, just to complete the answer, imagine that this uh, excess atology is confirmed that it's a new physics. Then you should optimize the detector for this channel and not for uh, 10 GB with mass. Yeah, yeah. This would be really great, I, I so believe. Better we wait a bit more before to commit yourself with, uh, with the detector technology, let's say. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. We have a we have a question from uh, Maria uh, from Carolina. I'll read it out. It was in chat. Thank you for your presentation. Too good also to know that you don't have COVID. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. My no, question is <laughs> my question is about the top of the xenon time projection cha chamber. What is the advantage of having a gas xenon space? But first gas, of all, yeah. Or you always have xeno, you have gas on top of a liquid. First, this is a natural feature, uh, unless a very spe special situation. No, the very the good advantage is that uh, you are able to extract the electron, the ionization electron from the liquid to gas phase. In the gas phase, you can accelerate a generated second uh, uh, light path because I mean the scintillation, the primary scintillation is due to some excimer. I mean the bound state of uh, ionized oxided uh, xenon atoms. Uh, you cannot produce uh, secondary light by accelerating electron in liquid. You don't manage. While if you extract electron in the gas phase, you can accelerate in the gas and generate a second light pulse. And by comparing this probed light pulse and second light pulse, you can, first of all, reconstruct the depth of the event one of the three coordinates. Second, you can uh, uh, construct this variable S2 over S1, distinguish particles with different D over DX that actually liquid argon TPC can do much better than liquid xenon, but in any case, we can do with some precision this distinction based on S2 over S1. So that's the reason why we want the gas in the, on top of the liquid, because we want to exploit the gas by extracting the electron in the gas phase and creating a secondary scintillation light. Okay, more more questions. Uh, hi, can you hear me? I have a, yeah, sure. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a question regarding the, the neutrino floor, uh, floor and the deep limits of the, the, the genome technologies that you were uh, mentioned. And uh, when when exactly will WIMP be queued? Like uh, as I understood with channel NT, you will be very close to the to the neutrino floor. Uh, after that, uh, is, is it possible to go beyond that and try to, to go to a smaller? Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, what was the, I mean, the community is looking at the detector with the uh, directional sens sensitivity, with the capability to distinguish the direction of, of WIMP, possible WIMP interaction. Because since we are moving towards the sinus, you feel the wind of winds coming from this direction. So if you are able to, to, to detect the direction, you can even distinguish between neutrinos that are coming from sun, uh, uh, from uh, uh, dark matter that is coming from sinus direction. This will be when you just reach the neutrino floor, you start to detect neutrinos, so better you invent another variable to distinguish between dark matter and the neutrinos. 
But you said when the wind deposit will be killed. I think when the wind deposit will be killed, when we detect dark matter in a different channel, if we will. I mean, there is always a theoretical framework in which you can invent it. a cross section. It's a bit different from what we excluded so far. Uh, so at the end, the last word will be, uh, will be, will be the measurements. I mean, Further questions? Um, Mileto? Okay, thank you for your talk. You. Uh, the research is very interesting, but I don't know if you agree with, with me. To be confirmed of the data, should we have another Xeno-like experiment on the ground that confirms the data of the previous one? Why does it seem to me that there is not another experiment under the same conditions? Or I am wrong? <laughs> no, 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 no. You are not at all wrong. You are perfectly right. And I completely agree with you. I mean, uh, uh, an evidence is not a discovery. Uh, so, I mean, from the experiment, I mean, this took uh, many years to develop this technology. So building such a detector is not something trivial. It takes, takes time, a lot of time. And I'm very proud of the fact that the Xenon Anton, that is the next uh, uh, Xenon detector uh, in, in the Xenon family, in one year from now, can say something interesting. Of course, this is not sufficient to claim a discovery. This would be, the, would be very nice uh, that another collaboration with a similar detector can tell you uh, something, can confirm these things. Actually, there are other detectors with a similar sensitivity in the uh, in, uh, in US, is LAX detector, and also in China. So we did, let's say, we did our best. So our best means that we have a detector that is in under commissioning now, that in one year from now can say something very interesting. And there are also other collaboration all around the world that they can provide some uh, results with the, with, the, with the different detectors, so with different analysis, maybe because they are different people. But let me, to, let me tell you something more. I, I imagine that this excess is confirmed. I would feel comfortable only when I see the things that detected also in, in, in argon technology detector. Because uh, I mean, also liquid argon TPC can do very similar physics. Of course, the physics of electron, uh, on the electron channel for uh, argon is a bit, uh, a bit more difficult because argon has some contaminant that can provide uh, electron events, so argon 39. But, I mean, the, the situation is a bit more complicated, but uh, of course, I agreed with you and we did our best. So, uh, Xenon collaboration is another detector that we run soon, and there are some other decks all around the world. Of course, uh, uh, if you see some success, better that somebody else with a completely different technology, maybe crystals or whatever technology, will confirm the success. Then the community can claim that there was a discovery. In the, at the moment, there are some evidence. Uh, and let's see if in a year from now, we convince a bit more the community that we have something interesting. So to go to get, you. Get the yeah. Nobel Prize, uh, you need more uh, technology that confirms your evidence. I have a, I have a follow. I have actually a direct sort of follow up question. What happened to Dama? <laughs> Dama is running and is taking data. Yeah, uh, but to the anomaly. No, no, it's still there. They have this uh, there. rate, uh, this rate modulation that now has a statistical significance. Of course, also statistical significance is something that. Uh, uh, you, 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 your statistical recipe, and you get this number. Anyway, since I mean, uh, I mean, those are experienced people, uh, very expert physicists. Uh, what they publish is 12 uh, sigma uh, uh, rate modulation, and so they have a strong evidence. We should understand why other detectors don't see the same signal. Uh, there is something very complicated in physics that we didn't understand. There is something very complicated in the DAMA detector that they didn't understand. We, we, we don't know. I think it's our duty to keep investigating. Indeed, the, the INFN, the, the National uh, uh, Founding Agency of Nuclear Physics in Italy, is putting a lot of effort in repeating the DAMA detector with other crystals in order to show that uh, either that to confirm there is a signal or to try to figure out what might be the problem. But there was no, wasn't there other detectors that basically went to the same parameter range and not yet, no, no. There are detectors in uh, in, uh, in Spain and also in Korea. They they just uh, getting closer and closer to the sensitivity of that, but but not yet. Even though I mean there was a recent publication of this uh, uh, cosine uh, experiments, 
uh, that provide no evidence of rate modulation, but uh, the sensitivity is not yet the one that was published, was reached by DAMA. So, the, I mean, uh, uh, the DAMA killing is not at all uh, final yet. I mean, there is still, uh, still to take data. And yeah, the text uh, rate modulation or disprove DAMA completely, but this uh, takes, will take a few more, more years. Um, okay. Um, more questions? If not, it's, I know it's pretty late there too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks you for the invitation. If, and, uh, hopefully I will be any visit your questions. one day. Yeah, uh, I hope so too. I hope so too. Thank you. Ciao uh, ragazzi. Ciao ragazzi. Yes, sì, sì, ci vediamo a gran sasso, dai. Ciao. Va bene. Ciao, ciao. A presto. Buonanotte. Ciao, ciao.